We have just read 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. Let me read that verse again as we begin our message this morning. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. I have a question for you today. What does it take, and I need you kids, everybody, pay attention. Thank you. I appreciate everybody staying here with us. What does it take to achieve Godliness. We've been created in God's image, but because of the fall of Adam and Eve, we have inherited a corrupt sin nature. To be sure, there's a part of mankind that longs to be pure, to be free, to be free from guilt, to be godly. But this path to a sweet relief of godliness and a release from fleshliness seems to get lost in a maze of religion, politics, and human depravity. The Apostle Paul here refers to godliness as a mystery. The Greek term refers to something that was once hidden and now revealed. How can I be like God? Man, all throughout the millennia, folks have come up with different ideas. How can I be like God? Because we are created in God's image, every human being is created with a God-shaped vacuum. Without truth, and without the truth of the Bible, men are left wondering, how can I be like God, and then coming up with their own solutions. So again, we have religion that tends to control the vulnerable masses by the corrupt few. Politics does the same. How do we get there? Godliness was a lifestyle that's beyond comprehension until we see Jesus. In the Old Testament, we hear stories of God. We hear stories of God's might. We hear stories of God the Father. We hear stories of God's power. We hear stories of God's glory, but no man has seen God. Moses was writing down all of the law, and he wrote down the Ten Commandments, of course, and he was leading the people of Israel out of uh, captivity and through 40 years of wandering in the desert, and as he was doing that, man, that was a tough job, and he asked God, could I at least see you? For a minute. Well, no man has ever seen God and lived. God said, I'll tell you what, we'll put you in the cleft of a rock, I'll cover you, and I'll come past you, and then I'll lift my hand for a minute, and you'll see the back part of me for just a minute, because that's all you could handle. It was a mystery, right? So God did it, covered up Moses and came past. Moses saw the hinder parts of, of God. And his face turned into a halogen light. Man, it was like one of those uh, cars that had those blue lights on it. It was just big, big, bright thing. 
and, uh, and the people of Israel, after they had seen this, the light of God just shining off of his face just because he had this brief encounter, they had to cover him up with a towel. Because, Moses, your face is distracting me. Now, that's just a little bit. So God's a mystery. What is this? Until Jesus. Because the Bible teaches that when Jesus was born, it's God that took on the form of man. And the Bible says that we beheld his glory, God's glory, as of the only begotten of the Father. And so now we get to see in human form, oh, this is what it's like to be godly. When they asked, would you show us the Father? Jesus said, if you've seen me, what? You've seen the Father. You see, you know, it's that whole thing. You want the truth, you can't handle the truth. You want to see the Father, you couldn't see the Father without dying because he is holy. Except now, all of that holiness, and all of that glory, and all of that might is now put into a human form, this form Jesus Christ. And now we can see God and we can see, oh, this is the mystery revealed. What is godliness? God took on the form of man and showed us what is godliness. Are you with me? You know, so godliness is not keeping a bunch of rules. Godliness is not controlling the vulnerable masses by, uh, by passing a bunch of uh, religious edicts that you wouldn't uh, lift with your little finger. Godliness is what Jesus looked like. Godliness comes through Jesus. Now let's, let's think about this for a minute. The Christmas story is about God becoming man. He came to earth. He lived a perfect life. He died a vicarious death, rose victorious from the grave, and now sits at the right hand of the Father. As we grow closer to Christmas, it's time to look at this verse because it summarizes the basic principles of the entire Christian faith. According to our text, the path to true godliness is through the person of Jesus Christ. Now listen as we reveal the mystery of godliness. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. The first thing that we need to understand about the mystery of godliness is the mystery of godliness is in the incarnation. That word incarnation is we're talking about God became flesh. Now I want to um, stop here for a second. Now this, everybody can get this. This is not, this is powerful, it's life changing. It is absolutely essential to understand salvation. When you accept the person of Jesus Christ, you're not accepting just a teacher or just a man or just a political a mover and shaker or just a social um, experiment. You're accepting the fact that very God became very man. Amen? Is that true or not? Is that true? Amen. Can we all agree that something that teaches or even intimates that Jesus is less than very God is error? Can we all agree with that? Okay, I'm not setting you up. This is just simple stuff. Can we agree that if we're going to follow um, a teacher, a scholar, or anything else, 
That scholar better believe that Jesus is very God. Can we all go with that? Yeah. Okay. That's better. Just a few of you. Because I was getting a little scared there. I'm taking a small side road. Tell you a story. Years ago, I went to Baptist Bible College in Clarkson, Pennsylvania. And God forgave me for that. No, I'm sorry. Um, God used that. But we were taught about the new versions of the Bible. That there are no major doctrines affected by the different versions of the Bible, like the NIV, the NASB, or, or things like that. There are no major doctrines affected. Now, can we all agree that the deity of Christ is a major doctrine? Okay. So one Saturday morning back in Scranton when I was young and not as wise as today, a couple of young men came to my door being witnesses of Jehovah. They believe that Jesus is not God, that he is less than God. Now, is that correct? No, no it's not correct. It's correct that's what they believe, but that what they believe is not correct. Are we all there? Okay, good. So they come, and that's what they're leading with, and I had just read in my devotions that day, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. Man, I'm going to shoot you in the face with that gospel gun right now. I was ready. But my King James Bible that I studied from was upstairs. My NIV that I didn't study from was downstairs and on the bookshelf. We were downstairs. I remember hearing my professors echo in my brain right at that point. Because I was like, I wonder what the NIV says. But I remember them saying, no major doctrine is affected. So I'm going to shoot them in the face with this gospel gun. I know the NIV is going to say the same thing because there's no major doctrine affected. You see where we're going here, don't you? So I whip out my uh, NIV and I say, let me show you a verse right here. The mystery of godliness is great. He was manifest in the flesh. Uh, what are we missing? And now they start to skip. They're <laughs> like, yeah, he would manifest. Not God. See, there, that's a better translation. I'm like, wait, how did this happen? I thought no major doctrine was affected. Man, I was there with egg dripping off my face. And I'm thinking, wait. I'm not at one of those crazy King James only nuts. Those guys are nuts. I thought there was no major difference. So I run, and I get my Greek Bible just to prove that I know more than they do. I get my Greek Bible and it says, Ha Theos. God was manifest. How do you take the word for God and make it He? You know how you do it? If you have a, if you're taking it from a copy that somebody took it out of the, the copy, someone maliciously removed it. Now, someone will say, that's just one word. That word is the difference between life and death. <coughs> Some people say, I don't know. You know, I love you, you, you guys. You guys, Evangelical Baptist Church, you're a little quirky. And I love you guys, though. You're, you're fun. But the King James thing, you guys got to get rid of that whole a King James thing that you're hanging on to because nobody else does that. Right, that's true. So you better get over here where we still believe the truth. 
It's not because we love the these and the thous, although figure it out, it means you and me. It's not so tough. But it does matter that either you're reading from a correct, preserved, holy copy or a corruption. That does matter. I didn't mean to take this side of the road, but I did, so deal with it. Listen to me, friend. If you have, and maybe you have an NIV or an NASB or one of those that you look and it says he and not God. You say, I didn't know that. Now you do. So now be warned. You know what? Do you think that if the devil got away with corrupting one word in your copy of what you call the Bible, you think that that's the only thing he got away with? First of all, if it was, that's enough to find you a real copy of the Bible. Amen? But it's not the only one. We'll not get into all those changes right now, but because it had to do with our main text verse, I thought it appropriate to share that with you today. God was manifest in the flesh. This is huge. Let me show you what we're talking about. The mystery of godliness, God manifest in the flesh. It's a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Go to Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. His name shall be called The Mighty Whoa. Is this baby the Son of God, or is this baby God? And the correct answer is yes. Both. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the answer is yes. The mighty God, the everlasting what? Father. Wait a minute. Is this son, is this baby God the Father or God the Son? Yes. yes. <laughs> how does that work? Man, I don't know how that works. You're talking about God the Father and God the Son in a little baby. I can't figure that out, but I can figure out God said it, so it's true. So someone's going to come back to me and say, do you know enough Hebrew and, and Greek and all of that other stuff to make the claim that you're making about the King James Bible? Yes. Because God's Word says that God was going to be made flesh 5,800 5, copies, handwritten copies, of the Greek manuscript says that God's word became flesh. Four copies say it's not God. Um, I think I'm going to go with God's preserved word. What do you think? Did you know that your modern, I don't know why I'm getting on this, but I am, so deal with it. Did you know that your modern copies, your NIV, your NASB, your CEV, and... Uh, and all of that are based on four manuscripts, Greek manuscripts. And the King James Bible is based on 50, and, 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 just one more thing. Those four manuscripts disagree with each other 3,000 times in three books. Your King James Bible comes from 5,800 plus Greek manuscripts. And according to a guy that didn't even believe that the Bible is the Word of God, but he's looking at the manuscripts, say these 5,800 manuscripts speak as 
one voice. Hmm. I wonder where the preserved word of God is. All right. The incarnation. Fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy. The creator concealed in humanity. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. And then down in, in verse 14 of John chapter 1, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the mystery of godliness, listen guys, kids, you can get this. Mystery of godliness is the incarnation. God became flesh. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 6. Turn there, please. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 6, coming after Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now look at Philippians 2 and verse 6. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men. Being found fashioned as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto the death, even the death of the cross. I'm just led to do this, so deal with me. Um, just uh, give me a second here. In uh, Philippians chapter 2, and we'll start with verse 6. I'm going to read from a different Bible. Now, Philippians 2, verse 6, according to the King James, who being in the form of God, thought not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men. Being found fashioned as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Are you with me? Jesus was humbled and took on the form of man. Are you with me? In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 6, well, I'll start with verse 5. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Now, verse 6 from the NIV. Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. And another Pastor says, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Can we say that those two are saying two different things? Can we say that to say that Jesus Christ cannot grasp being equal with God is abominable doctrine? And we carry it around and call it a Bible. I got it. The key to Christmas is that God became flesh. That is the foundation of all of this. And so, you know what? If the devil were to jump up in your face and say, hey, I don't think that Jesus is very God, God didn't become flesh. We'd say, get out of here. Slew foot, I don't believe your stuff. Get out of here. But if we say, you know, in the original Greek and Hebrew, it says that Jesus considered this something not to be taken advantage of. Jesus said that, that being 
God in the flesh, not something he could grasp. And we say, whoa, that's so cool, that's so neat, that's so deep. And we just bought in to a heretical lie. You say, well, not all of these new modern translations are filled with heresy. That's true. How do I make my stupid cat take a pill he doesn't want to take? Well, yeah, I could stuff it down his throat. <laughs> but but, but he, he usually has something to say about that. Or I could surround it by good stuff that he loves. Now you how do you think the devil does it? Since the Bible says he is more subtle than any beast of the field. He does it subtly. He puts all that other stuff. Oh, well, it's so wonderful. He doesn't say thee and thou, so I can understand it. I mean, he talks just like we do. It's so sweet and so wonderful. And that's fine. But man, when you mess with major doctrine, we got a problem. God was in the flesh. God was justified in the spirit. That word justified means vindicated. For we are not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. God was, God in the flesh was seen of angels. The whole Christmas story, angels are at his birth. Angels during the temptation, when, when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, the angels came and ministered to him. During the agony of Gethsemane, the angels were there. Proclaiming the resurrection, the angels were there. Witnessing the ascension, the angels were there. Seen of angels. Now this isn't just he was seen of angels because the angels see everybody, that wouldn't be saying much, would it? This was God who became flesh was seen of angels. God in the flesh was preached to the Gentiles. For God so loved the, not just God so loved the Jews, not so just God so loved the elect, God so loved the world, preached to the Gentiles. And believed on in the world. It's truth we say, uh, set you free, and you shall know the truth. The truth shall set you free. Received up into glory. And he's now at the right hand of the Father, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame, is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. When the angels saw at the ascension, Jesus going up into heaven, the angels saw the uh, apostles, and they looked like this. They said that for a while. Flies coming in out of their mouth. Well, maybe not. Angel tapped him on his shoulder, hey, what you staring at? The same one that left is coming back. And he just told you to get the gospel to the whole world. I suppose you ought to get busy. In like manner, as you see him go, he's coming back. So here's the deal. What's the, the essence of the Christmas story? This little baby, Jesus, this little baby Jesus is not just a cool little baby born in a feeding trough. This little baby Jesus is God all 
tucked in to that little baby. Now that's a mystery. How's that happen? I don't know. The angels were losing it. Man, they couldn't stand it. They had to tell somebody. And so they scared the tar out of a bunch of um, shepherds in the middle of the night. Well, glory to God in the eyes. Man. Shepherds were not expecting that at 3 o'clock in the morning. Here's the deal. God became flesh, was justified. He never sinned. Saint of angels, preached to the Gentiles, received up into glory. That is the Christmas story. Have you trusted Jesus? What are you trusting in to get to heaven? <coughs> Have you trusted Jesus to get you to heaven, or are you hoping to get to heaven by being good enough? You need to trust in Christ alone. That's the whole reason why he went through all of that, to come and live a perfect life and then die in your place. And Christian friend, are you telling people the reason for the season? And are you using a sword are you using a garden tool? A, short, a sword is a perfect word of God and it cuts sharp. Some of these other things, we've been sold a bill of goods. You know what? It's easier. It's better. It's, it's more natural. But it's based on four four manuscripts and all of those are flawed with each other. The King James based on 5,800 identical manuscripts. King James supports the deity of Christ. Modern translation attacks the deity of Christ. You tell me. Where are you going to stand? What are you going to do? Now, do I own an NIV? Sure. But do I hold that as Bible? No. Can I learn from an NIV and say, um, these are the things to warn from? Yes. Do I use the NIV to correct the true Bible? No. I didn't intend to go there today, but I did. And I think that maybe some of us need that.